It's 1193, and Richard the Lionheart, King of England, is missing. Eleanor of Aquitaine, Dowager Queen of England, and the only person holding the web of Angevin alliances together is frantic. She received word her son's ship wrecked in Italy, and that he'd attempted to travel overland to his brother-in-law's territory in Saxony, but never arrived. Meanwhile, her son John is already on the continent, pursuing an alliance with Philip of France, who's only too happy to encourage more Plantagenet infighting. Then, the letter arrives. It's from Holy Roman Emperor Henry VI, informing the court that King Richard is his prisoner. And he will absolutely release the monarch. You know, provided he receives the sum of 150,000 marks. That's more than double the annual revenue of the English crown. Eleanor, now 71 years old, gets her quill and parchment and starts fundraising. Today's historic tale is brought to you by the Curiosity Stream Nebula Bundle. More on all of that awesomeness after the episode. The seeds of Richard's capture were sown during the Third Crusade, when at the Siege of Acre, he'd clashed with Leopold of Austria, badly enough that his troops pulled Leopold's battle standard down and threw it from the wall. Infuriated by this, and suspecting that Richard had his relative killed during the crusade, Leopold knew exactly what to do when he heard from informants that Richard was passing through his lands disguised as a returning pilgrim. Just before Christmas of 1192, he arrested the King of England and shut him up in a castle. When word of this got out, it caused a huge stir, and seeking a more powerful ally, Leopold turned Richard over to the Holy Roman Emperor, who then demanded the exorbitant ransom. 150,000 marks was a lot of money. Eleanor immediately started a letter-writing campaign, petitioning the Pope on Richard's behalf. The letter is, well, extreme. In it, she says she wishes for death, for blindness, that her brain and blood and marrow dissolve in tears, that she feels her entrails are being ripped out, and asks the Pope to pity her now that young Henry and Geoffrey are dust. Two sons remain in my solace, she wrote, who today survived to punish me, miserable and condemned. King Richard is held in chains. His brother John depletes his kingdom with iron sword and lays waste with fire. In all things the Lord has turned cruel to me and attacked me with the harshness of his hand. The letter worked on the Pope. He excommunicated Leopold of Austria, since it was illegal to detain a crusader. But by then, Richard was in the Holy Roman Emperor's custody, and even the Pope wasn't going to tangle with that. So Eleanor set herself to raising the ransom. Not an easy feat, since Richard had stripped the royal treasury and squeezed out new taxes to pay for the crusade. But she whipped up support by casting Richard as a national hero who had boldly taken the cross and won great victories, creating a structure where giving to the cause was an act of loyalty and patriotism, and nobles competed to offer the biggest contribution. There was a danger, however, that they would be secretly outbid. John and King Philip had offered the Holy Roman Emperor 80,000 marks to keep Richard imprisoned while they tried to put John on the English throne. But that wasn't going so well. Though Philip and John had overrun Angevin territory in Normandy, Eleanor and Richard's council had started hardening English defenses as soon as John left for France. So when John's supporters rose up and he crossed the channel, they made little to no progress. Until one day, in February of 1194, when John got a message from Philip. It read, Look to yourself. The devil is loose. Eleanor had raised the enormous ransom and managed to get it safely into the emperor's hands. Meaning, King Richard was free and on his way back. John, unable to best his mother, ran back to Normandy. But Richard, probably with Eleanor's counsel, was in a forgiving mood. See, when Richard left for crusade, he'd skipped John over as heir, instead naming his then two-year-old nephew, Arthur I, Duke of Brittany, as his heir presumptive. Arthur was Geoffrey's son, born after his brother died, and got the nod, presumably because he was a toddler, and therefore unlikely to seize the crown while Richard was gone. Yet Richard's capture likely frightened he and Eleanor at the prospect of the English throne going to a five-year-old, who it should be noted that in the meantime had been kidnapped by Philip and raised in Paris, making him too tied to France. So it turned out, John was the logical choice, and his family would just ignore a little rebelling. Richard, somewhat patronizingly, and again probably with Eleanor's advice, declared that John was, but a child, misled by his advisors. I'm sure that John, who was 27 at the time, just loved that. But becoming heir presumptive was worth eating a little crow. And John did it. In fact, he settled down, severed his connections to Philip, and went about fighting to reclaim the French lands that he'd helped Philip take. Meanwhile, Richard returned to England for a ceremonial redo of his coronation, just to remind everyone who was in charge, and sitting next to him at that ceremony in the Queen's place, was not his wife, Berengaria, but his mother, Eleanor. 
As Richard returned to Normandy to reclaim his territories and fortify his castles, Eleanor retired to the abbey in Aquitaine where she'd buried Henry and where she'd planned to spend her final years. She was, after all, 72 years old. Having built an empire, she was now leaving it in capable hands, with a steady line of succession. But then in March 1199, she got a message. By the time she got to Richard's bedside, the wound had already gone gangrenous. During the siege of a minor castle, Richard had come to the front line to see an absurd spectacle. A French child was scampering along the wall of the castle, firing at Richard's troops with a crossbow while deflecting incoming arrows with a frying pan. And as Richard the Lionheart watched, amused and totally unarmored, the boy lowered his crossbow and shot the king through the shoulder. Richard died in his mother's arms, having never produced an heir, and Eleanor would bury him in her abbey at his father's feet, leaving the crown of the Angevin Empire to John, the resentful son, always passed over, demeaned, and called deceptive and villainous, now ruled England. Despite her reservations, Eleanor backed her sole remaining son, ensuring that he, rather than her grandson Arthur of Brittany, would take the throne. But remember years earlier, the Earl of Chester, an old-school Anglo-Norman who still felt tied to the French court, had abducted Arthur to Paris. John's nephew, now 12, had grown up with Philip's son Louis and was unabashedly pro-French. So, John enlisted his mother for one last diplomatic mission. To keep the peace with France, he'd agreed to marry Philip's heir to one of his nieces, the daughter of his sister Eleanor, who his mother had married to the King of Castile, and his mother would also select which niece would be best. The trip was arduous. She had to cross the Pyrenees again and was briefly held hostage by a French noble, but she accomplished the mission, bringing the girl back. Yet at the age of 77 and in poor health, Eleanor was slowing down. She had to pass her granddaughter off to others and retire to her abbey. However, she was dragged out again a year later when John went to war against Philip. Knowing that young Arthur would strike for Aquitaine, the aged Eleanor traveled to her chief fortress and rallied her forces there, where her 15-year-old grandson besieged them. But John swept in and captured Arthur, allowing Eleanor to finally retire to her abbey for real this time and take vows as a nun. And there, she rested, living in quiet until she died at the age of 82, buried with her second husband and sons. By one measure, John squandered her hard work. He was a disastrous king who lost much of the French territory his mother had protected for decades via political maneuvering, and after a revolt by English barons, he would be forced to sign the Magna Carta, limiting royal power. But even John couldn't totally squander Eleanor's decades of work. Due to her careful management of succession and political alliances, England held Aquitaine and several other claims in France, remaining a cross-channel empire. This set the agenda of English-French relations for the next two centuries and laid the groundwork for the Hundred Years' War, which you can watch our series on here. On top of that, Henry and Eleanor's Plantagenet dynasty would rule England for over three centuries. But not just England. The fact that she had birthed three kings and two queens, defended their claims, and strategically married her children into important provinces all across the land gave her the nickname the Grandmother of Europe. She also inspired a cultural legacy of books, plays, and films that borrowed elements from her life, ranging from Shakespeare's King John to Catherine Hepburn's Oscar-winning performance in The Lion in Winter to The Queen of Thorns in Game of Thrones. And honestly, that really does sum it up, because when we imagine what political power looked like for women in the Middle Ages, we're often thinking of one woman, Eleanor of Aquitaine, mother of empires. And if you've enjoyed coming along with us on Eleanor's journey these past few weeks, not to worry, there's plenty more historical adventures to be had from us and other awesome creators over on Nebula. Nebula, of course, being our Buy Creators for Creators streaming service that's home to a ton of our favorite educational entertainers on the internet, such as us at Extra Credits, 12 Tone, Princess Weeks, and Tier Zoo. And I know I've said this before, but with Nebula, creators like us have gotten to take control of our own destinies a bit because all of us get a seat at the table and get a say on how the platform is run. Plus, thanks to the support of Nebula subscribers, we're able to offer every video on there, including all of ours, completely ad-free. Not to mention all of the fantastic Nebula originals creator friends of mine have made. One of my favorites being Patrick H. Willem's hilarious movie, Night of the Coconut. Oh yeah, we got an original frickin' feature-length film on there now. It's awesome. 
Heck, I've even moved my personal podcast and done a few originals on Nebula myself because that's how much I believe in what we're building over there. And you know, on that point, I am happy to say that CuriosityStream thinks I'm right about all this and has teamed up with us over at Nebula to offer what I truly believe is the best deal in streaming today. When you sign up for CuriosityStream using our link in the description, you'll get a matching Nebula subscription for free. Not a trial or anything, like full membership, meaning you get CuriosityStream's thousands of big-budget nonfiction films, videos, and award-winning original series, while also getting amazing content from the best bunch of creators the internet has to offer, all for under $15 a year. For instance, if you happen to love content about, oh, I don't know, just taking a wild guess here, say Richard the Lionheart, then you've really got to watch the Curiosity Stream doc, Besieged Fortresses, the daunting fortress of Richard the Lionheart, which explores the impenetrable keep that Eleanor's son decided to build to bar the route along the Seine, thus asserting his supremacy in Normandy, you know, for a while. So if any or all of that sounds up your alley, head on over to curiositystream.com slash extra credits right now to get both of these phenomenal streaming services for only $14.97 for an entire year, which is 26% off the regular price, which still to me is just mind blowing. And when you do, not only will you get to watch some of the best content this old series of tubes has to offer, but you'll also be directly helping out channels like ours in the process. Actually, seriously, just to go off script for just a moment, your response to us over on Nebula has been wonderful and reaffirming, and we are super grateful for all of your support. And uh, yeah, can't wait to see you guys over there. A hearty thanks of legend to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angelo Valenciana, Arclight Games, Casey Musja, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, and Skylar Holmes. 